Chapter 2. A Brown Kid on Guam and Three Investigators on the Prairie While our belongings were trucked and then flown to Guam on a military cargo plane, my dad drove us in a 1977 Chevrolet Caprice Classic station wagon. It was dark brown with fake wood paneling on the sides, with a burnt orange headliner inside. Oh yes, it was 1970 styling. We drove across the continental United States from South Carolina to California, often well into the night, and the next night, and the next. I woke up at least once per night from the back of the station wagon where my parents had folded down the seats to make a makeshift bed for the kids, and I would see everyone asleep except for my dad steering the land boat straight and true upon an unknown highway. When I couldn't see beyond the headlights, staring into the inking darkness, I would think, we're gonna fall off the earth. My memories after that are a blur as my dad arranged transport of that station wagon to Guam and as my mom, my siblings, and I visited relatives in California. I don't remember the Los Angeles International Airport, the stopover at Hawaii, or even our final arrival at Guam's airport and at the nearest hotel. My first memory of Guam was when I woke up in our hotel room, which seemed pretty posh after days sleeping in a car, cheap road trip motels, and relatives' spare rooms. We were so way up in the multi-story hotel that I saw the Pacific Ocean well before me outside the balcony window. It was late dusk. I heard loud voices and rhythmic music below me. When I looked down, I saw two half-naked fire dancers, each twirling and tossing two sticks, the ends aflame. With a first impression like that, I knew that Guam was going to be magical. Most non-military folk in the States know nothing about Guam. I certainly didn't until I lived there for four years, 1978 through 1982. Guam is a tiny tropical island, about 30 miles long and between four at the narrow middle to 12 miles wide. From a bird's eye view, Guam looks like a tiny mountainous green bow tie tipped on one end so that it's crookedly vertical. It only has two seasons, rainy and dry and the average temperature is about the high 70s to low 80s Fahrenheit with cool breezes. It is about 1,300 miles north of Papua New Guinea, 1,500 miles east of the Philippines, 1,600 miles south of Japan, and 4,000 miles west of Hawaii. It's a lonely looking little island surrounded by nothing but clear blue ocean with the deepest part of the Earth's ocean to the east of it, the Mariana Trench. My family lived in military housing on, on the mid-southern west-facing coast of the island. The majority of military housing in my neighborhood was the same. One long, single-story, flat-roofed, white stucco rectangle divided into a duplex with a carport for each half. The entire inside of the house, walls, and ceiling was white and needed to remain so per military housing guidelines. The front door, which we entered from the carport, led straight into the kitchen. The kitchen was pretty straightforward with a deep sink, simple white laminate counters, off-white linoleum floor, a green portable kitchen table with foldable legs, and a refrigerator. What sticks to my mind is the smell of white rice cooked in a huge rice cooker and the sour, salty, fishy smell of adobo chicken and tamarind fish stew. If we kept going forward, we then passed the narrow laundry area leading to the back door and the backyard. If we happened to glance at the tops of the washer and dryer, we usually saw laid out small fish, butterflies split open, and salted and then air dried, which contributed to the fishy smell of the kitchen. Once out the back door, we saw a huge banyan tree, its wide leaf evergreen branches nearly blocking our view, a little bit of grassy yard, and beyond that a low hill that slid down into the backyard of the duplex behind us. If we turned right, we crossed through a doorway into the big common room that served as a dining room with more linoleum flooring, and living room with green shag carpeting. It was in the common room where my parents placed the heavy wood furniture that they transported from each successive move from the beginning at Taiwan. The formal dining room table, oval, seating for six, took up most of the dining room area with an electric organ tucked in a corner on one wall. On the other wall was a matching dark wood china cabinet on steroids, with intricate scroll work, glass and cabinet doors, and oxidized bronze handles to match. It took up most of the wall. Tucked next to the china cabinet was more heavy wood furniture, a matching sideboard where the sparse cutlery lived, and a fully stocked bar with mahogany leatherette on the edges of the countertop, with a real brass bar below 
as a footrest and matching swivel bar stools. The living room had three had these weird Kelly green lemon yellow splotchy black plush fabric sofa and matching U back chairs that had casters on them so that they were easy to move around. When our parents weren't around, Wendy and I tipped the U, U chairs on their backs and seesawed across the living room, but we always remembered to put them back where they belonged. The coffee table in front of the sofa was heavy wood with a marble green panel top and a center storage area with little, little cabinet doors. Matching the coffee table and the china cabinet was this massive cabinet wall unit that nearly spanned the entire back living room wall. Designed by my dad, he trained in engineering and design in a trade school before the Navy and handmade in Taiwan, it was the centerpiece of their furniture collection. My mom decorated it with Asian-style vases, jade flowers, Japanese dolls in glass boxes, and reference books that my godfather gifted me on occasion of my baptism when I was a baby. Those reference books will play a role later in my post-Guam life. My dad used the wall unit as a music station where he placed his massive reel-to-reel -reel and vinyl music collection. Lots of disco, Elvis Presley, and Filipino serenades for, serenades for party sing-alongs. In the lower cabinets, while placing his reel-to-reel -reel tape deck, receiver with its many knobs and buttons, and speakers in the central and lower shelving spaces. Sitting in the back corner, like an immense altar, was the television. It was a huge wooden cabinet housing a cathode ray tube that glowed green when we turned it on, either by hand or the infrared remote control, until the colors faded into place, like a Polaroid picture developing before our eyes. Just like in Taiwan, Great Lakes, and Charleston, the TV was a large part of the household. Anyone in my family immediately turned it on in the morning and left it on as long as someone was awake in the house. TV programming back then wasn't 24 hours, as a local TV station signed off around midnight with an image of the American flag waving and the national anthem before the TV signal ended. If we woke up early enough, usually just before daybreak, and turned on the TV, then we saw the signal come back on with an image of the sun rising and the Beatles song, Here Comes the Sun, playing in the background. Our family was a devoted TV-watching family, and this was the only TV. So we watched a lot of family fair, like Little House on the Prairie and The Electric Company, as well as what my parents liked, such as The Love Boat and Fantasy Island. Placed against the wall next to the hallway, leading, heading for the bedrooms, was the tall, dark wood grandfather clock with its brass cylindrical weights and pendulum. It chimed on the hour and half hour and sometimes scared me when I didn't expect it, especially when I went to the kitchen for a late-night glass of water. As I can attest, when my parents assigned me chores when I turned seven years old, all of that wood furniture was a pain in the butt to dust. My siblings, when they were old enough, and I used many old English-infused rags to keep all that wood gleaming to our mom's satisfaction. After the splendor of the common room, the bedroom seemed almost like an afterthought. Walking along the long hallway, we saw three tiny bedrooms in the hall bathroom. Wendy and I shared the back bedroom, where we slept in two twin beds. Our parents shared the tiny master bedroom with Eric, who would have been a toddler. Then, in fall 1979, when I started second grade, my youngest sister Cheryl's crib was squeezed in a back corner of my parents' bedroom. The bedroom clo closest to the living room was the playroom, where we kept all our toys. And God help us if Mom saw any of our toys out of that room and a couple of fake leather beanbag chairs that had a tendency to leak tiny styrofoam balls. The reason our house, especially the common area, was so bedecked was the fiestas. Yes, there were celebrations for big events like birthday and holidays, but there really needed no special reason to cook a massive amount of Filipino food like lumpia egg rolls, pancit noodles, grilled beef and pork, and mountains of steamed white rice and then opened the front door to what often felt like the entire U.S. Navy and Filipino community in Guam. However, my parents weren't the only ones who did this. It seemed like every weekend, someone in our neighborhood put something on a grill, and we had an instant block party. For really special fiestas, a group of fathers, grandfathers or uncles, went up into the mountain farm, chipped in on a huge pig, took part in its slaughter, and grilled the carcass into lechon roast pig. This pig roast happened whether it was in someone's backyard or on the sands of Gab Gab Beach, only five minutes away from our neighborhood. During those parties that lasted well into the early morning, 
The men and women sang, drank, danced, talked, and played countless rounds of mahjong. We kids ran around outside, played tag or red light, green light, or scared each other with monster stories of the Thautamuna, Guam's ancestral spirit, which we learned about in school, rising from the banyan trees and getting us. When the mosquitoes got too bad or it got too dark, we all piled inside the house, went to either the kids' bedroom or, if my parents were the hosts of the party, in the playroom, turned off the lights and played Marco Polo, screaming like crazed school-age banshees. Kathy, Janet, Oliver, John John, Marcy, Sarah, Joanne, Mary, Laura. These were my playmates who felt more like cousins. Countless women and men who were not bl blood related to my parents, we kids all called auntie and uncle. It was like living in a village or a small town where everyone knew everyone else. Every parent looked after every other parent's kid, and every kid saw each other as a playmate and cousin. With everyone helping each other, nobody ever felt poor, and nobody ever felt lonely. Between parties and playtime, my parents took care of our own needs. While Pa, as we called him and still call our dad, was away on duty on the USS Proteus, a ship that supplied and supported submarines, Mom had a cottage industry in which she babysat toddlers, sewed and altered clothes and linens, and crocheted cozies, curtains, tablecloths, and elaborate sculpted doilies. The money that Mom earned supplemented Pa's Navy pay, which fed and clothed three and then four young children. With Mom's money, I had my first bike, a used red beauty with a banana seat, deep gorilla handlebars, and coaster brakes. The words, the clean machine, were in groovy white letters painted on the bike chain cover plate, so that's what I called it. After I raced my neighbor Marcy on training wheels and one of the wheels fell off, but I kept pedaling, Marcy's dad took off the other training wheel, and that was that. I was on the clean machine everywhere. I explored the neighborhood, hopscotch from one friend's house to the next to play, had more bike races, and went to the playground. But when I wasn't doing any of those, I ran errands for mom, who would have to stay home because of babysitting. Often it was too, often it was to buy stuff like milk, rice or milk or whatnot from the seven-day store, a corner convenience store nearby. Mom, one of ten children to rural hard scrabble farmers, never had a bike and never cared to learn how to ride one, even when she could afford one. But she understood the need for a bike. Even though she gave up farm life, Mom still preferred to have a garden in the back, but housing rules also limited what she could plant. So instead of having decorative bushes in the front of the house, we had Chinese red-hot pepper pe bushes, pretty and edible. Mom pickled the red, orange, and purple peppers and vinegar in jars. Also, we had a tall coconut tree in the front yard, which Mom climbed to get the heavy fruit. She even did that when she was pregnant with Cheryl. Wendy, who was five going on six years old at the time, and I, who was seven, screamed, Mommy! Mommy! As our tiny, five-foot-tall, eight-months-pregnant mom, craving coconut, scrambled up the tree like a manic monkey, a machete clenched between her perfectly white teeth. Gotch! She exclaimed after she chopped one-handed as one and then two more heavy green orbs dropped from the underside of the tree. Too afraid to have the coconut fall on our heads, we let them fall and watch each one bounce on the springy, springy grass. Mom scrambled back down and scolded us for not catching the coconut, just in case they split open and therefore spilled the tasty coconut, coconut juice. Fortunately for us, they didn't. After Mom removed the tough, fibrous outer husk and chopped off the tops of the smaller, brown-shelled balls of coconut, we drank the watery juice of fresh coconut before she cracked apart the shell so that it was easier to eat the crunchy white coconut inside. When Pa was home from sea, he night fished off the white sand shores of Gab Gab Beach. Bringing his spear gun, a hand net, and a handmade floating net made with, with an inner tube and fish netting, Pa, a certified diver, snorkeled under moonlight and a tiny visor light. In the morning, I often woke up to find Pa's nighttime catch in the kitchen sink. I found many kinds of flopping fish of various sizes, and usually an octopus or two, which slid along the bottom of the sink and changed color angrily at me. The first time I saw an octopus in the sink, its tentacles rising up from the sink, I screamed, my sister screamed, and Pa woke up from his, nap, from his sleep, laughed. Besides live sea life that became lunch and dinner, I saw tiny geckos no bigger than my pinky finger. 
I found their tiny round eggs on the front screen door and saw them every once in a while in the ceiling of my bedroom, their funny little feet secured as they saw me upside down. Unlike the angry sea life in the sink, Wendy and I weren't scared of these little visitors. Since we weren't allowed a dog or cat, these island geckos were the closest thing to pets we had. The green tree frogs, however, Wendy and I could live without. During an especially heavy downpour during the rainy season, our front yard became a frog pool. Like clockwork, Wendy was terrified to walk to the bus stop. Come on, Wendy, we need to go. No, no, she always cried out. I pulled her along past the frog pool to walk down McMillan Drive to the school bus stop on the corner. While I wasn't as scared of the frogs as my sister was, I was sick to my stomach when I saw the brown tree snakes that came out of the jungle to get at those frogs. Inevitably, they were run over under the wheels of the cars and jeeps that ran in front of the bus stop. Seeing squash snakes after a morning breakfast of fried rice or blueberry muffins wasn't a happy start to an already wet, froggy morning during the rainy season, which ran from July to November. While we military kids and some military-affiliated civilian kids lived on the coast, our local public school, New PD Elementary School, was farther in and farther north from us. So the little yellow school bus wound its way from the military housing complex, going no faster than 30 miles an hour as it climbed up roads cut from the mountain jungle. It stopped every once in a while for a kid waiting in front of his or her rural house or farm, usually a brown Tramado, native Gomenian, kid. We were mostly brown little kids, as white kids, usually military dependents, were actually the minority on this island. Chamato and Filipino-American made up the majority. We knew we were close to the school when we saw the veteran cemetery to the right of us with its white crosses. It's weird now to think of an elementary school across the street from a cemetery. Back then, however, we didn't think any of it, although my friends and I sometimes wondered if it had any Tatamuna. The bus arrived in front of New Petey, and we all filed out, all dressed in either t-shirts, shorts, jeans, Hawaiian shirts, sensible buckled shoes, sneakers, or even sandals. Since New Petey was a school that went from kindergarten to sixth grade, we ranged in age from barely five years old, like Wendy, when she started kindergarten, to 12 for the oldest sixth graders. The campus was a series of one-story cinder block buildings painted light blue and white. They were arranged into three adjoined sets of squares with three open courtyards in the middle of each square of, of buildings. The classrooms opened into their own inner courtyard with perimeter fence playground areas on the outside of the play classroom buildings. The front building was the administration building, which also held the cafeteria, where they would serve such specialties as fresh fish with rice and chicken with gravy on bread, and the library. I don't recall the library when I was in Miss Williford's first grade class. All that comes up in my memory is when I wore a homemade lime green and white dress that itched like crazy for picture day, when I counted to a hundred in front of my class, and when I went to my first school field trip watching Star Trek, the motion picture. My first memory of the school library was in second grade with a teacher that I can't remember her name to save my life, but was nice and very pregnant. We single filed out of our little open window classroom across the asphalt-paved courtyard with its many chalk-drawn hopscotch squares and numbers, and entered the library. The library was mainly one story high, but it had a little mezzanine level where the audiovisual stuff were. There were huge, heavy wooden tables and high wooden bookshelves with jars of preserved Pacific sea animals like lionfish, sea cucumber, and porcupine fish, which swam in formaldehyde and sat on top of the lower shelves. The tallest bookshelves lined the walls of the main areas of the library, and we used the attached rolling ladders to reach the higher shelves. Everything felt heavy, lush, and woodsy. I was enchanted. We kids were left to explore. Sitting crisscross on the carpeted floor, I discovered the fictional works that would obsess me for the next couple of years. The Little House books by Laura Ingalls Wilder, and then the Alfred Hitchcock and the Three Investigators series created by Robert Arthur. As mentioned earlier, my entire family watched Little House on the Prairie on TV. We enjoyed and related to the misadventures of the Ingalls family. Like the Ingalls family of the late 19th century, my family moved around a lot as we follow Pa's better opportunities. Like Carolyn Ingalls, Mom quit her elementary school teacher position when she married and then moved away with Pa, albeit by commercial airplane instead of covered wagon. Traversing the Great Plains by covered wagon was like crossing the states by station wagon. Finally setting up a somewhat permanent home in Walnut Grove, Minnesota, where Mary, Laura, and Carrie 
helped out their mom and pa when they weren't at school or church, felt a lot like my family finally setting up a somewhat permanent home in Naval Air Station in Ganya, Guam, where Wendy and I helped out mom and pa when we weren't at New Petey or the Catholic Church down the street. I saw myself in both Mary and Laura. Like Mary, I was the oldest and therefore required to be more responsible. Like Laura, I was a tomboy and sometimes got into trouble with the grown-ups. So when I explored the library and looked through the stacks, I instantly recognized the title of The Little House on the Prairie on the spine of a book. When I noticed that the author's name was Laura Ingalls Wilder and that there were eight more books, two before and six after, in the series, my seven-year-old mind suddenly felt ten times larger than it had before. Laura Ingalls Wilder was a real person. Laura Ingalls Wilder wrote these books. Wait, Laura married Almanza Wilder? While by the second grade I was a proficient reader, I had never read a book all the way through. But here were nine of them, and they all looked fat with stout hardcovers. Just like the Harry Potter-loving millennials and their younger siblings 20 years later, I wanted to know what happened to my favorite hero, Laura Ingalls. Motivated as I was, and happy to see that there were black and white pictures here and there in the book, I checked out the first book in the series, Little House in the, in the Big Woods. The first sentence I read was, Once upon a time, 60 years ago, a little girl lived in the big woods of Wisconsin in a little gray house made of logs. Much later, I learned that the book was originally published in 1932, so the 60 years ago was 1872. But I didn't think of that at the time. I already knew it was during the pioneer days because of the TV show. I don't remember how long it took me to finish that book, in between schoolwork, housework, Sunday school, and playtime with friends. Once finished, however, I returned it to the library and checked out the second book, Farmer Boy, which turned out to be the childhood of Almanza Wilder. Then Little House on the Prairie, when the Ingalls family moved to Kansas, on the banks of Plum Creek, where, when they moved to Minnesota, by the shores of Silver Lake, when they finally settled down in South Dakota, the long winter, Little Town on the Prairie, these happy golden years, when Laura and Almanzo married. Finally, the first four years when Laura and Amonzo started their own little farm. Sometime before the end of my second grade year, I had read all of the Little House books and learned a few things. One, the books were very different from the TV series, and I liked the books better. The descriptions of pioneer life were gritty and sometimes alarming. Two, People from the 1880s weren't much different from people in the 1980s in regards to their hopes, their disappointments, and their problems, especially when they dealt with disagreeable and sometimes scary people in situations beyond their control. Three, I knew new words and was a faster reader. Finally, four, I was hungry for more books. Since I binge read the Little House books, I had to look elsewhere. That's when I discovered the Alfred Hitchcock and the Three Investigators Children's Mystery Series in the school library. I don't know what drew me to the Three Investigators series. Perhaps it was reruns of the Alfred Hitchcock Hour or the Hardy Boys Mysteries on TV. All I know is that I became obsessed. The first book of the series, The Secret of Terror Castle, was published back in 1964, written by Robert Arthur Jr. Other authors like William Arden and M.V. Carey, also wrote in the series, which brought the book total in 1979 to 30 books. So I had plenty of books to pick from, Alfred Hitchcock and the Three Investigators. The plots were Scooby-Doo type stories, minus the comic relief of Shaggy and Scooby-Doo, in the late teen, early 20s interactions of the rest of the Scooby gang. The Three Investigators were three 14-year-old boys, all school friends, who started an amateur detective agency headquartered in a Los Angeles family junkyard. Jum uh, Chubby Jupiter Jones, first, and greater, first investigator, was the brain and leader. Tall and athletic Pete Crenshaw, second invest investigator, was the muscle. And the smallest of the three, Bob Andrews, records and research, was the bookworm. Sure, they were older than I was at the time. But unlike the Hardy Boys or any other mystery or detective show on TV, Jupiter, Peter, and Bob were limited in their mobility, since they couldn't drive, their resources, since they weren't rich, and their access, since they were underage. Yet they, were, yet they always solved the mystery and won the case with their logic, observation, and persistence. I mean, they were kids, 
and detectives. Also, while Pete may have fit the stereotypical male hero in his looks, he respected and followed his leader, the non-heroic-looking Jupiter, and also respected and worked along with his peer, Bob. Mixed into the mystery was action-adventure, car chases, kidnappings, secret traps, espionage, and the glamour of Hollywood and L.A.'s international culture. As a Navy brat and tomboy, how could I not be obsessed with these books? Thanks to the Little House books, I was a fast reader. I tore through the school library's collection of the three investigators like potato chips. When I couldn't find more books in the library, or if the library was closed but I didn't have a book with me, I begged Mom to bring me to the bookstore in the Navy Exchange and leave me there when she shopped in the other places in the NEX, laid out similar to a civilian mall. Since she was more than happy to have one less kid to think about and knew that I would stay put, this became our shopping routine. Mom dropped me off at the bookstore, and I went to the children's book section. Once I found the three investigators' books, I sat down on the carpeted floor in front of the bookshelves, carefully took out a book that I hadn't read yet, and started reading. Since the three investigators' books in the bookstore were in paperbacks, I always made sure never to break the spine. Mom rarely bought me the book since, she, since it wasn't budgeted. Then I read until Mom showed up, shopping bags and siblings in tow, to go home. Of course, these days, bookstores, what few brick-and-mortar bookstores are left nowadays, would never allow unattended non-teen children in their stores. Any parent doing that today would likely also get in trouble with store security, the store manager, or even Child Protective Services. So I definitely do not recommend any parent to do that with his or her child. But the late 1970s to early 1980s was a different time, and Guam back then was a different place. Parental non-supervision outside, outside the home was commonplace for any kid older than six. First, parents taught us kids common sense skills and assumed that we wouldn't do anything stupid and could figure out problems on our own, just like Laura Ingalls and Jupiter Jones. But most importantly, they trusted the adults in our neighborhood to keep an eye on us. In my case, even though the workers in that bookstore didn't know me or my mom by name, they knew we were part of the Navy family community and therefore belonged there. I certainly didn't feel that I was with strangers, as customers perused the bookshelves around me, the staff left me alone, and I tore through the pages as fast as I could before Mom arrived. I don't think that I managed to read all 34 Three Investigators books that were published between 1964 and 1982, but I know that I read everything that I found at school and in the bookstore. What's odd is that there was a local public library, yet I don't recall going there on a regular basis nor checking out books. The habit of freeloading off of the NEX's bookstore and the store staff's tolerance of me was more ingrained than the habit of going to a non-school civilian library. Either way, I satisfied that craving to binge read, and I haven't read another three investigators books since Guam. The last one, number 43, The Mystery of the Cranky Collector, was published in 1987. I wondered if that childhood obsession of mine stood the test of time, so I recently checked out a couple of Three Investigators books, The Mystery of the Screaming Clock, number 9 in the series, and The Mystery of the Deadly Double, number 28, from, irony of ironies, my local public library. After I read both, the repetitive nature of the Scooby-Doo-like plot lines, the overly dramatic dialogue, and the often unreali unrealistic deus ex machina devices that guaranteed happy endings jarred me. These books were not meant for grown-ups. While I was a 7, 8, and then 9-year-old kid, these books were irresistible, and I gobbled them up like circus peanuts and candy corn. But just like with circus peanuts and candy corn, I, as a reader, outgrew them. However, I wouldn't have grown as a reader if I hadn't gone through that three investigators obsession when I developed that habit of reading for leisure and fun, not just for school. Sure, it wasn't great literature, but it was my own personal discovery, my own choice. The Alfred Hitchcock and the Three Investigators series was mine. As a young kid who had very little control or power over her destiny, that was a massive realization. And once I became a reader, nobody could take that away from me, not even in the middle of a blackout.